impact that you can have in addition to making a lot of profits and money, uh, you, 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 you just have to go and uh, face it head on. Uh, Evercare hospitals uh, came into Nigeria uh, and uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are doing very well and actually raising the benchmark uh, for quality of, of healthcare provision in Nigeria. I just want to confirm about the statistics on infant mortality. Is it the same across the country or the result are basically scored by a particular region, more like bringing the old national average down, or is the statistic is um, I, I can look, look into it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very good, very good presentations. And uh, quite disturbing in, in when the luxuries can have, we, we see the value that we can add. Are governments receptive of the ideas that actuaries have? Is the conversation happening? Um, if not, who, who should be to, to the policymakers, or, or, or should it be the other way around? Because if you look at the uh, case of the example you gave of Nigeria with the, the, the brain drain, uh, is that perhaps um, a symptom of the frustration that the professionals have responsibility in terms of what we need to do for our own continent. Thank you. Uh, th th thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll first answer in the case of the national scheme in Nigeria. They actually do employ uh, act actuarial skills, not necessarily qualified actuaries, but they actually have actuarial students uh, involved. I think it, for a scheme of that size, you probably need a proper actuarial department, and I think uh, the local actuarial, soci local actuarial society can play a pivotal role uh, in the advocacy for that, and even in, 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 in increasing the healthcare specialism within the local, uh, local actuarial, actuarial market. Um, in the case uh, of, of Nigeria, I, I always believe that um, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, I, 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 some, some time was around, um, ar around that national insurance scheme that the government is putting together. What are your thoughts are on that? Uh, we will take two more after. Okay, okay, I'll go. So, so I'm, 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 I'm completely on the, on the other side. Uh, I just uh, happen to, to be a bit left wing when it comes to this discussion. In my opinion, uh, the provision of private health care uh, to fix the problem. So if everyone has to go and there's, uh, there's, there'll be significant interest, both in the business and the political establishment, to ensure that the local hospitals work. For as long as there is a two, three-tier system, then, and you as the decision maker are not exposed to the perils of poor infrastructure, poor service delivery, then it takes away your incentive to fix the problem. So I actually would go for compulsory, uh, uh, for compulsory um, uh, uh, contribution from 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 everyone uh, to to the health scheme through through taxes, and sex rates in Nigeria are actually very low, which uh, further compounds the problems we're discussing. Oh, okay, so. Um uh, 20, uh, 2009 to 2019 or so, and in Nigeria and Ghana. And Ghana. But uh, I'm kind of uh, interested, uh, why not also give us uh, um, the rate or the percentage decrease uh, of mortality, for instance, for Nigeria from that 2009 to 2019, and we know that of Ghana from that of 2009 to 2019. In that way, we will better know or appreciate whether the Nigerian government is, is, is actually trying uh, to decrease the mortality rate, whether there is an increase uh, uh, in the uh, health care system. Uh, if, uh, I think we would better appreciate it if we are to know the... Um, my response, 
uh, would be that with every extra dollar of insurance spent, there is a decreased marginal benefit. So if you were to ask me how I would approach, if you were to ask uh, contributors to the high mortality, malaria, high infant mortality, dysentery, and gastrointestinal diseases, and I would allocate my primary health care spend to just that. Within a short time, you can immediately see mortality rates decrease by over 50%. You don't have to set up a sophisticated scheme or a perfect scheme. You just want to set up a scheme that allows you to lower, to, to, to get the low hanging fruit. Now, if you have addressed that, any additional spend will accrue much less benefit. So if I start then comparing the percentage, percentage changes, considering that Ghana is already starting in a much better place, I maybe end up conveying the wrong message. Um, I don't think that statistic would be, would be very helpful. who finish secondary schools. Most of them will probably have three or four kids. And the ones who didn't get there will be the ones having more children. And most of the um, you know, secondary school educated ones are very particular about having three or four children. And thus, they do their best to make sure that they stay alive. And I mean, as much as I hate to say it, the more children a person has, the easier it is to have an increase in the infant mortality. So even in the United States, you will find it there. I mean, people living in certain areas have very, very low infant mortality, but you go to Mississippi, Alabama, and other places, you will see that uh, 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 it's very high over there, relative to, say, New England. So that it does exist. The disparities are there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mine is just a comment. Uh, you can't talk about Ghana without uh, we making a comment. Um, if you look at what you presented, um, you see that Ghana seemed to look better um, because at the early stages of the public scheme, they employed actuaries to work there. App apparently, some of us have somehow flirted with them in terms of development. And you will appreciate that we have come a long way. They have their challenges because of funding, but Basically, they were looking at the primary care from where you were coming from. We looked at the primary care. And the mix is such that the private perspective is at the secondary and tertiary. Are you getting it? So the focus was to get a lot more to assess the primary care. And that makes the picture you painted very good. But when you start going up with ages, and you look at maybe retirement age onwards, access to medical health is almost not there. Are you getting it? So Ghana has its problems. The actuaries have their numbers, they develop it. But like you are saying, political risk is there. Can you believe that when Ghana's scheme started, the politicians were telling everybody to be covered? 
just right from the beginning. No vesting period. Utilization high. You said medical uh, um, uh, health was like telling them it's free. So you walk into the hospital like you walk into a supermarket and pick an item. You can imagine, now it's stabilized because the actuarial department there is functioning. So I will encourage the other African countries to employ actuaries to work in the health sector. And that can give us a better picture and a better functioning system. Thank you. Thank you so much. All too soon we've come to the time we could have. A, a, oh. Just allow our senior. Oh, Mark. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. You have been in, in a, a very interesting uh, session. As a Nigerian, since uh, this discussion started, I've never been comfortable. <laughs> so I appeal to the president to allow me to say something because I won't be here and this discussion will just push aside. You see, um, my first concern is data, source of his data. I'm not comfortable and I don't know how he got his uh, data. All the statistics he was giving, no source of data provided. That's one. That's, that is the uh, first thing. Second thing, he left the crucial part of this, actuary services apart. Let us look at it as demographic uh, angle. You see, um, most of the hospitals you have in Nigeria are not well equipped, and that is a source of brain drain you talked about. That's one thing. Nobody will like to go to a hospital and die. You are going there to save your life. And when you say that there are no facilities, you are about to go to a place where you get the services. Uh, we have so many doctors that are trooping outside the country. Those ones that are remaining behind, no equipment to, to work. So that is a major challenge they, they have. Then we have so many quack, quacks, because when you have this kind of problem, quacks will come in. So there are a lot of quacks. And these quacks, I, I wonder how you got the data from them. <laughs> yes, that's a, a serious issue. So you, it, the societal problem, is there very much in play with what you are discussing. I think I'm very happy that you are from Nigeria and I'm living in the same city with you, Lagos. We shall engage on more talk. <laughs> and then, then carry further research. Mm. Mm. I'm a social statistician. Mm. OK? So you have touched me. <laughs> so we are going to see. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, okay, can I just quick, quickly respond? Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, I, will, I will share with you the slides. All the sources of information are quoted, are quoted on the slides. But um, uh, as, as a closing point, I just want to make it clear that my presentation was not to present a negative light on Nigeria or on Ghana. But my presentation was to emphasize that we have a job on our hands. We have specific focus points that you and I, when we sit down to have, uh, to, to, to have our Eforiro, they are specific points that we can actually begin to look at to become part of the solution. And for us to be able to do that, we have to throw the statistics and identify the areas where we can have an impact. And my, the overall message I wanted to give out there 
is that we may put a lot of effort in ESG, climate change, and so on, but this is Africa. And in Africa, the issue of healthcare is a, a, a public emergency and should have a lot more of our tenant, attention and focus than other issues that we probably may be importing from abroad. Oh, please go ahead. We want to thank our panelists so much. Um, Masimba actually flew in here just last night, and here he is presenting. So we want to thank you for all your efforts. That was inspiring. Very apt presentations, generating healthy deliberations, and creating an avenue for further engagement between our chief and our presenters after the program. So a round of applause for them again. There's a planned excursion to Cape Coast tomorrow. Cape Coast is actually a very beautiful city and central to the story of Africa and um, slave trade and the evolution of it. It's actually, um, they actually have very nice beaches, castles, very friendly people, and I urge all of you to be part of this excursion. So for all those who want to take part in this Cape Coast trip, please confirm your participation with the registration team when we go on the coffee break. This is to help them with planning and logistics um, support. We have a representative from Social Security and National Insurance Trust here. They are key sponsors of this conference. And just like we did for all the others, we give them a minute to give us a message. So please, Rep from Snitch, if you're here, you have a minute to do so. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raonika Anumdaku. I work with Social Security and National Insurance Trust. SNET is in charge of administering the uh, SNET pension scheme, basically the first year. What we do is to collect contributions, we invest their contributions, and then we pay um, employees when they are due. We have special benefits like the old age pension, old age lump sum. We have the survivor's lump sum. We have invalidity, invalidity scheme or the invalidity uh, benefit. And we also have immigration benefits. Currently, we want to um, advise the self-employed, those that work for themselves, like mechanics, the fruit seller, the watch seller, to also join the scheme and enjoy our benefits. Um, we have a stand outside there in case you want to merge your numbers, that is your SNET number with the NI number, or you want to update your records, please do uh, feel free to go and do so. Thank you. So Social Security and National Insurance Trust, uh, they've set up a registration table outside. So for all Ghanaians here who have yet to match their SNET numbers with the NI number, this is an opportunity for you to do so. We also have a rep from SOA, and equally, one minute to hear from you. A round of applause. For you. We'll skip that for now. We'll do that um, later on in the program. So we we'll zoom straight away to our next plenary session, and that's going to be on the topic, Imagine Actuarial Systems in Regulatory Reporting. And to do that for us, we'll have Keegan Patel from FIS Global, Maya Jeringa from Solveco, Pedro Pereira from AquAid. So please, show time. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to start off the presentation by uh, thanking the ASG for the opportunity for allowing our organization to, to present up on stage here and to reach a broader audience and you know just expose our, our solution. Um, I mean, for those who think I'm a bit familiar but just can't put your finger on it, I'm the gentleman who tried to dance here yesterday. 
And uh, by, way by way of introduction, I'm uh, Keegan Patel. I'm a sales executive and account manager for uh, FIS Global. Um, my region is Africa with a key focus on, on West Africa. And um, the solution that, that I sell is uh, called Profit. And, um, you know, Mr. Neil Togo said something uh, yesterday. He said, um, Africa evolves. And in order for Africa to evolve, he sees actuaries uh, in the lead. And in order for our actuaries to, to, to be in the lead and to, to, to allow them to, to operate and to, to perform at their peak performance, I think it's crucial that, that they need to have the equipment and the tools to do so. And um, FIS Profit is actually, actually at the forefront of all of this. Um, it's an actuarial uh, risk modeling tool. And um, it, it provides actuaries with a platform to build actuarial models, to run these models, to analyze the data, and to report back on performance, and to further improve the, the insurance products that insurers offer. The, the particular um, profit product is also very modular in nature, and I mean, FIS deliberately uh, designed it this way to make it accessible to medium size, to small insurers, as well as extra large insurers. And we do this by offering different modules to different insurers and to different sizes, so you have complete control of the license costs and also of the, um, the, the scope in which you want to use it. In terms of the, the, the modular nature of the system as well, this also provides you with a platform to make it very scalable. So, you know, you could start off with a small investment and, uh, for an example, you, you could use profit in your life space and then at a later stage just continue to build on it. So it's very scalable and we like to build with our clients and expand as their businesses expand. So if you look at the slide uh, behind me, this is the full profit uh, product suite. And over on the left, uh, if you could just go back to the previous slide, please. So on the left hand side, um, we have the, the pre-production side. And here we have tools like the data uh, preparation tool and the data mining tool. And this assists you with things like, um, you, you know, helping with the, the lapse assumptions, your mortality assumptions, and it also goes alongside with the data conversion system, which seamlessly puts all of this data and cleanses it into the production environment. So as we move from the pre-production environment, as the data moves into now uh, the middle block, which is the, the production environment, this is where we have profit. And this is where all of the actual calculations get done. And this is sort of the heart of the system where all of your, your actual calculations get performed. And as it, once, once you, you, you've done your calculations and you have your, your actual results, it then moves over to our post-production um, side of the solution. And here we have a, a data repository system that is quite um, um, robust and it's, it's, it's um, um, a multi-dimensional um, repository. So it, it allows you to manipulate the data to, to transform it into a manner that, that's acceptable and that's meaningful to, to actuaries and to the rest of the business as well. And I think that's an that's a important part of, of uh, you know, extracting or producing the set of data. It's, it's actually making it uh, understandable by the rest of the business as well. So in terms of the session today, uh, we are discussing the solution, but we're also discussing you know, uh, regulatory, uh, re regulatory um, compliances in, in the market as well. And I think you know, IFRS 17 is top of mind for everyone. The, the deadline is fast approaching. And uh, just in terms of a quick uh, history overview of the, the, the FIS solution, um, FIS has started working on our, on our IFRS 17 solution in, in 2015. And uh, some of you might notice that that was even before that the, the standard was published. And uh, we work closely with the ISB and we work closely with the draft um, um, reporting standard. And we've done this so we can have a bit of a head start. And we work closely with our Korean uh, clients to build a solution. And by the time the, the standard was published in 2017, a month after that, FIS had uh, a production-ready environment for IFRS 17. And that really gave us a kickstart into the market. 
And as the years progressed, we were able to, to tweak the, the, the solution as the, the, the requirements changed. And we are also able to improve our implementation strategies to make it uh, much more affordable and, and uh, accessible to, to all of our clients. So year on year from 2017, we just continue to improve our product and continue to uh, improve our impl implementation methodologies as well. So in terms of the solution, I mean, there's, there's five key areas. Uh, so, so the first one being the actuarial calculations. And as I said, you know, this, this is the uh, profits bread and butter. This is where all of the, 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 the core um, functionality lies. Um, you know, just um, you, you can perform all of your actuarial calculations, your insurance cash flows, your, your asset modules, like your ALM calculations, et cetera, and, and your capital models. And then we move over to the, the financial calculations. And this is where we added in um, IFRS 17 specific type calculations, like your CSM calculations. And we do all of that in, in a group calculations library. The third part being the data management part of it. Uh, I think we can all agree that, you know, with the, the introduction of IFRS 17, um, it, it given a rise to a lot of granular data and um, you know, it's, it's important how we, we manage that data and that we have a solution that's able to take away that, that complexity away from your GL systems so it doesn't bog it down and, and we have a sub-ledger in, in, in place that, that will assist with that data management. Um, and then I already touched on, on the, the, the fourth part which is the, the, the sub-ledger which sits right in front of, of your GL, and that, once again, it takes away that complexity. And the fifth part being the toolkit, and this is where uh, FIS tried to standardize the implementation for IFRS 17, and this will make it uh, much more affordable, much more cost-effective, and for the insurers that are a bit late in terms of making a decision on IFRS 17, this puts a massive advantage on you because we're able to fast track the implementation because we've standardized um, the, 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 um, the implementation. So I generally like to put the slide on screen. It just provides a bit of a, a graphical representation of the data from end to end, right? And that's exactly what profit is. It's a so if I start at the purple block, right? Um, that's our source system. That would be your policy administration system. And just before the data moves from the source system into profits liability models is where I spoke about our data cleansing tool. So we have a tool that will act as an ETL tool that will ensure that the data that passes into profit before you do your liability models is cleansed and it's the, the, the right data that's flowing into profit. And once you have your, your, your profit liability models and, and you've done your, 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 your necessary runs, um, it then moves over into the IFRS 17 group calculations library. And in this library is where we perform things like your CSM calculations. And if we move over to the blue blocks is where we have our IFRS 17 uh, modules. And what this does is, um, I think the challenge with IFRS 17 is it, it requires two, uh, sort of two uh, departments of, the, of an insurance business to work together. One being the actuarial and the other being the finance bit. So in the two blue blocks there, uh, what happens is once we have our, our actuarial data, it then moves into IDR, which is a data repository, and to EAS. And this massages the data and converts it into to, uh, a, a format that's more meaningful by the finance team. It actually creates the double, uh, the double entry ledgers for you. So it then also moves into EAS, which is the sub-ledger. Many could, uh, could, could argue that um, you, you could achieve this in your GL system, and, and I have to agree you could. However, the advantages of having a sub-ledger system is you don't have to interfere or, or create any uh, disturbance in your GL. You're removing all of that um, granular data away from business. So the, the sub-ledger takes care of all of that granularity, and it then posts it into your, sub, uh, into your, your master general ledger. So in terms of um, you know, the learning curve and uh, investing in, in, in um, 
in, in compliance. I mean, it's, you know, we mentioned that it, the FIS is a global organization, and th this is one of the, the benefits and the perks of, of partnering with the, with the global organization. So, you know, because the solution's been in development from 20, 2015, we do all of that learning curve and that investment for organizations. So you don't have to incur the cost of, of learning by doing or, or, or trial and error. FIS has actually gone a long way down the learning curve, and we've made that investment into compliance to, to make sure that uh, we provide a, a robust solution for our clients. So uh, just a little bit about our activity in, in Africa from a FIS perspective. So um, in October 2018, uh, we had our, our product owner come down to, to Kenya and um, we had a, a, a three-day conference there. And um, at this stage, uh, Africa was on par with, with uh, Europe and with the Middle East in terms of their readiness of IFRS 17. And at this stage in October 2018, um, insurers were gearing up to do gap assessments with, with the consultancies, with local consultancies, with international consultancies, and they were also uh, preparing an implementation strategy, and really we were on par with, with uh, the rest of the world in terms of our, our IFRS 17 readiness. I think the, the delays or, or the postponements of the deadline, um, you know, seen F, uh, Africa um, just drop further and further behind in terms of, um, you know, procuring an, an, an IFRS 17 solution. So this slide is just some of the good and the bad news in terms of where we are at today as uh, insurers. So in terms of the good news, I mean, uh, FIS, like I say, started developing the, the solution from 2018, and we're now in 22, so the solution is much stronger, and um, we, we've performed over 100 implementations uh, across the board, and as a result of that, uh, you know, the, we, we're far down the learning curve. we in fact so far down the learning curve that FIS is, off, is able to provide um, a fixed fee implementation for IFRS 17. And that provides, um, you know, it provides insurers with a bit of comfort that you're able to budget for the solution. It, it mitigates uh, factors like uh, project overruns and, and running over budget in terms of PS costs. And we've also limited the, the project risk because we, we've, we've so far down that learning curve, like I've said. Um, the good news is, as of now, even if the, the organization has not made a decision in terms of IFRS as yet, it's not too late. It still can be done. And later you'll see a graph that, that we've, we've come up with that, that sort of uh, plots the risk attached to this. Uh, in terms of the bad news, I mean, since 2018, uh, not much has been done for, for IFRS 70 is, is willing to invest much time or, or resources into this. And um, East and West Africa, as well as the southern part of Africa, is quite behind the globe uh, in terms of the requirement, and there's been no signs of, of any extensions in the deadline. So if you could just move to the next slide, please. So like I said, in terms of the, the, the graph, um, you know, it's not too late to make a decision. Um, it is now that the decision needs to be made. So if the organization has not yet made uh, decisions in terms of your, your risk strategy, your, um, your um, actuarial um, risk calculations or your actuar actuarial risk modeling tools, now's the time to do so. And you see that as we move past the July mark, you know, the risk of not meeting the deadline, it, it just expands uh, exponentially. In terms of uh, you know, procuring a solution or choosing a solution that, that benefits your business, I mean, it, it's often a bit reassuring to know that you, you, you're partnering or you're choosing a vendor that solution is, is proven by track record. And the words on screen really um, you know, just um, reiterate the fact that um, Profit has been in the market for a long time. It's been tried and tested by uh, massive insurers, by medium-sized insurers, by smaller insurers, and it works for all organizations. Um, I, I encourage uh, everybody to, to uh, maybe just uh, visit our website and, and to take a, a closer look at some of the awards and the functionality um, that, that we do offer. Um, if you could just skip to the next slide, please, sir. 
uh, one more. So that brings me to a close of the presentation. And um, I want to encourage the audience, you know, if you have additional questions or uh, additional clarification questions, to um, meet me outside and to um, let's just continue the discussion. Let's exchange some contact details. And um, let's set, set up some meetings so that we can deep dive further into the, the, the offerings of profit. And um, at the same time, let's also come and get some free FIS merch while you exchange your details with me. And uh, that's all from my side. So thank you for your time and for your Thank you. Um, I also just want to ask, is it possible to have a mic that I can move around? Yes, so this is my slide. Uh, thank you, Keegan. Did you guys hear how nice he made it sound? Uh, fast track implementation, he, he even used the word massaging the data. Everything is rosy with EPROS 17. Thank you so much. Um, my presentation is uh, Again, every time I come to these conferences, I like to share experiences of things that we've seen in Africa. So this is again the actuary systems and what's going on and what if we have seen. So yes, in terms of the, the agenda, don't be scared. I, I didn't dance yesterday, but I do have the, um, I think I get the prize for the shortest presentation, which was on day one with the teachers conference. So I usually talk quite fast, so don't be afraid. So the next slide, I need to give you an introduction in terms of Solfco and why I'm speaking today. So I need to say, I don't know how many of you have heard the saying that if you want to be truly, truly, truly happy, you need to understand the core of yourself. So like, who are you as a person? And to find that out, you have to think back, this one saying this says, think back many, many years ago, when you were very small, what was the profession that you had in mind? What did you want it to become when you were very small? Because in that lies the answer of who you are, truly. So I wanted to become a doctor. Now, obviously, I'm not a doctor today, because I did spend one day in hospital shadowing a doctor, and I realized there's no way I could do that. But the reasons I wanted to do that was because I wanted to help people. I remember being so small, wanting to give free health care to everybody. Can I be a doctor? I just want to pick everybody up, take them to a hospital for free. That's what I wanted to do. So in terms of Solfco, we are an actuarial company. We, I started this business in 2006. And since we started, we got involved with system projects. People asked us, come help me with my data, come help me with my systems. I actually don't have time, just do it for me. And that's how we got into this kind of business. We do extremely uh, massive amounts of data rebuilds. And why do we do that? Because migrations don't work. People didn't get us in early enough. The system they chose was the wrong system for their business. We do a lot of work in that space. We are suspension funds and insurance companies. But the reason you need to know that I want to help people is because of everything that I've learned in my 15 years in Solvco, I started what we call the ASA System and Technology Committee, which is a way to help the profession learn from what I've seen, learn from what my company has seen. Because there's too much money being wasted of us not sharing the knowledge. The, this, oh, sorry, no, just the, the first slide still. So yes, the system, the system and technology committee is a, a group of volunteers. And I remember when I started this, it was very difficult to get actuaries to actually commit their time to join the committee and to share their advice for free. The one guy actually said to me, Mia, but the stuff that you know, put together some sign of a training and you can charge people and you can make so much money. No, that's not what I want to do. What makes me happy is to help people. So this stuff is available on the ASA website. We're actually very busy. We have information notes which we've created, which is things like if you are sitting in an insurance company and your boss comes to you and says you have to sign off this migration, what do you do? Where do you start? 
So we have that information available. What do you need to check? What data do you need to check? What is your responsibility when you sign it off? What is not your responsibility? So it's those kind of skills that we wanted to transfer. The second thing I did is I also invested in administration software because in Africa, the things that we've seen is extremely, extremely scary. We once got asked, and I'm not going to mention the country, we once got asked to help them reduce their data reserve. And I remember when Jean flew there, she called me. When she was there, she said, Mia, the system that they want to implement is more than the GDP of the country. And I couldn't believe it. And this, this poor company was forced to implement the system by their parent company. So what we've got is we've got administration software specifically for those companies who can't afford this massive, massive systems. And it's, it, you don't necessarily need it. So let's come back to the need, and that's what we do. So that's why I'm talking to you today about everything that we do in Solvco. So yes, my next slide. In retirement funds, yes, I'm going to be talking to you about defined contribution funds, and then obviously IFRA 17, because that's our favorite. So yes, the next slide shows retirement funds. So what you see here is the little gray block is where we operate. We know that trustees on retirement funds, they are concerned with the administrator, and on the other side, you've got your auditors and you've got your actuaries. But very often, the trustees actually don't get the detail that they need. So what we've created is something where everything talks to each other. So we've created a report that says, is your administration working? So, okay, so you've got your accounts, you've got your admin report, but do the two match? And the kind of stuff that we've seen, the last one we did, was there was a whole month of contribution that didn't go out. It was still sitting in the bank. And they didn't see it because they also had a death claim pending. So they actually missed the whole point of it. So then you think, okay, it's probably not so much, but, but it is, because those interests actually does add up. So we make sure that everything talks to each other. But you have to be very, very conscious. If you go to the next slide, with retirement funds, there's no, because we are used to seeing the data coming across. Pension funds, they like to just take over opening balances because they say it's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's almost like a bank account, so you don't really need the historical data. So they do pay us quite a lot of money to fix the data afterwards, which is the problem. A, a DC valuations is probably a bigger problem because there's a very big push specifically in South Africa, and we've also heard that yesterday, to remove the actuary from the DC valuations. Because they say it's a bank account, why do you need to pay a valuator to get involved in this business? So what can we do as actuaries who are not valuators? Let's give them a report that, so that the trustees can still see everything balances. But retirement funds, really, it's a very, very, very scary space. And we did one fund where we had to rebuild for three years. After that, we saw now even the section 14 that they did was wrong, and eventually we had to go for back for six years. So it turns out to be quite a big exercise to fix something like that. We've seen, and I know it's gonna sound funny, but what the administrator does is they actually, if they can't match and they can't balance their data, they create a line item and they call it Mr. Reserve, or oh, there's another one that I saw the other day, it's balancing mister. So that's actually a member that they create in the database to balance everything. So those are the kind of things we look at. So it's quite scary what's going on in that space because actuaries are not involved. So yes, my next slide. So this is insurance. So again, the gray, the gray block is typically where actuaries are not involved, where we get involved. So you're quite used to the yellow actuaries on the pricing side, on this side, they price their products. It goes actually through a very long process in the gray box. Then actually it goes to the valuation team. But if these two don't talk to each other, then there's quite a massive mismatch. So part of what we're also doing now, which I'm busy with for the ASA Society, is I'm actually doing an information note on pricing. So if you're pricing actuary, what do you need to think of in terms of the gray block? so that the valuation actually will set the right assumptions. 
Now what's exciting, well, let's call it exciting, IFRA 17 on the other side, you see I didn't put it in a block because it's not really going anywhere, <laughs> it's there. But it is nice to know that IFRA 17 now comes from the gray block, so it talks to your life data, and you need your accountant, and you need your actuary involved. So that's quite an interesting space. So it's, it's the first time that they're kind of merging, but you can see the pricing guys are not there. So this really comes after the pricing has already done. Yes, sorry, my next slide. So naturally, because of what we've been doing, we got pulled into IFRA 17 work. Wow, but it's a scary space. It's, it's not my typical client. My typical client would normally be the pricing actuaries. They know there's something wrong with the data. The IFRA 17 guys, no, they don't want to implement it. It's the accountant's problem. It's the actuary's problem. You're running around. It's, it's an IT problem. What is it? That's why I'm saying, Keegan, well done on making it sound so rosy. <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult space. And what I have found is that actuaries are actually quite far removed from the data, and I, kn I know they are far removed, but I, I think I forgot how far removed they are. So I just got an email now from a client. The admin system actually can't produce the data needed for IFRA 17. So where are we now today? It's, it's June. So I can't change admin system now for the IFRA 17 data, but they actually really only picked it up now that there's a problem, and it's been pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. So I think I, I didn't really know that actuaries were so far removed in terms of getting the data broken down the way that IFRA 17 needs it. So in terms of IFRA 17 software, there's a lot out there. There's really, really a lot of software. So what we've seen is most of it has been developed on top of your valuation software, like we've heard from Keegan. So on top of, so the guys were doing, actually that's now happening in Africa, it's all international recognized systems, like Keegan has also mentioned. But what's quite nice is the, is the use of implementation partners. This is, this is not just for IFRA 17, but a lot of software vendors are saying, you know what, I want to develop, I don't want to implement. So let me develop and you guys implement. So. If you're looking for an IFRA 17 solution, then have that discussion. So who are the implementation partners? Because it makes it a little bit easier, especially if they're in-country. So even if you want to become an implementation partner, if you're a consultancy, these guys are very open to do it. So actually have that conversation and rather do it in-country than to get somebody from overseas to come and do it. So yes, companies we've seen. So if you... If you have a, a somebody like uh, a Sunlam, a Hollard, or Old Mutual, those guys are saying, this is what you have to do, and you actually don't have a choice. So most of the time, you won't even know what system they're using, the holding company, but they will dictate. The cost we find is very high because there are no local systems. So whatever system you want to implement, it's going to cost you. The data availability is a problem. Thank you. Yes, it is a problem because now, apart from the fact that your system can't actually break down the premium and the components the way it does, you also don't have the history that's needed. There's a massive reliance on third party, so resources is definitely a problem. Training we find is very difficult because the providers are not in, in country. So, if, so that's why I also said the implementation partners can help with that. So if you've got an implementation partner, they can assist with the training, but the training we find is very difficult. And then this one is interesting, the companies have already changed solutions. So these companies that already made a decision, they, they tried for six months and then they said, no, this is not working, I'm gonna change it. So that's quite scary because it's very expensive and if you haven't made a decision yet, people have already changed, so make sure that you make the right decision. There, there aren't very much in-house development that we've seen. So there are some, but not a lot. I think I've seen two. Yes, okay, sorry, next slide. So the best fit for IFRA 17, so I've got the two there. So this is definitely not a one size fit all. There's a lot of systems out there, and I think it depends. So it depends the size, 
the size of your actuarial team. If you don't have a very big actuarial team to support the solution, make sure that the solution is not actuarially intensive. And that's a very important point. The size of your accounting team, the type of business, because depending on the type of business, it will depend what kind of IFRS 17 solution you'll need. Do you need massive st uh, data storage? Not so much. What are the calculations that you need? The size of the business, the cost, implementation partner. What does your IT infrastructure actually look like? So is your data system working? Will it integrate? Will it not? And obviously your portfolios and groups also goes with the size of the business. And then if you are in a space where you don't know if you should change, it, you know, this is, this is not an administration system. So it's not like you stuck for life. This is accounting. This is an actuarial calculation system. So you can change. So, and we've seen it. So don't feel like you're making this life-threatening decision and you won't be able to change. Just one thing that I've seen is some of the companies do have cancellation fees in their software, so they would say if you sign up, you sign up for three or four years. So I think just be careful of that. But then have options available. And don't be scared like you're getting stuck into this. Yes. And that's, um, that's it from me. So you see, I do, I do get the prize for the shortest, quickest talk. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. I think my question will go to the first presenter. I, I think when we see IFR 17 presentations, it's always very fancy, nice, everything is working well. But I have a worry because uh, you didn't present about the cost. Okay. Ah, so we'll talk after. Ah. So we've got another presentation online, and then we're going to take some more questions from here. If somebody could just confirm that uh, uh, that they, you can hear and see me, maybe I will share my own presentation. I believe. Possibly a sign from the previous speakers, uh, uh, whom I thank, of course for perceiving me, that you can uh, hear and see me, because you're the one on camera right now. I'll take that as a yes, so thanks a lot. I will share my screen then for the, for the presentation. Uh, please, uh, of course, interrupt in case uh, uh, there's any uh, problem with uh, sharing the screen and seeing the, the solution. So thanks a lot for allowing me to speak at this conference. It's the second time actually I speak at a conference uh, uh, organized or co-organized by the International Actuarial Association. And it's always a pleasure with a very uh, high level of attendance. And from what I've seen uh, up to today, I think the Actuarial Society of Ghana has made the uh, I think it's coffee you all, but of course, I'm very sad to not be able to, uh, to be there in person with you all. Um, so in terms of the presentation, let me introduce myself. Uh, my, I'm Mark, I'm one of the actual data scientists at Accurit. We are a software company uh, focused on insurance pricing, uh, but the scope of the, today's presentation is uh, a little bit more, um, let's say, academic and not really uh, focused on, on our software itself. Uh, if you're interested to discuss uh, more about what we do uh, and you find our approach uh, interesting for you, of course, do not hesitate to uh, reach out to, uh, to me or, or any of my colleagues. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, in particular is how you can combine uh, automation and transparency, which are regulatory requirements uh, all across the globe, um, with um, uh, sort of automation in all of the actuarial modeling and uh, why we think credibility uh, can help, which of course is the tool that 
uh, has been known to actuaries for uh, for a long time. So let's start from the let's say the workhorse uh, of the actuary mod modeling, um, which is uh, additive models uh, or generalized linear models, uh, uh, if you if you prefer. Um, so they are of course a great balance between predictive power and uh, uh, covering ourselves uh, for adverse selection, and at the same time, because of their transparency, they satisfy uh, regulatory requirements. So they are, uh, of course, currently widely used in the actual uh, community. And their main advantage, as mentioned, is not only um, the, uh, the, the type of output that they provide, so the rating tables that they're able to provide, but also, um, and most importantly, we think, uh, the ability for humans, uh, for actuaries, uh, to visualize their output and to understand their output uh, and potentially making changes uh, uh, to that to satisfy business or regulatory requirements. Here I have a simple example that I will be using throughout the presentation about an additive model um, that uh, uses the age of the driver, uh, an indicator of his driving experience, and different uh, vehicle characteristics uh, uh, as predictor for the model. So uh, you can see clearly from this picture that you have a higher risk, of, uh, let's define it as a general risk for now, a higher risk for young drivers uh, with respect to uh, more uh, older drivers, uh, um, the older your car is actually, the less you are risky for your uh, portfolio, uh, or for the portfolio of the insurance company, I would say. Uh, and of course, the highest uh, uh, the vehicle speed, the max speed is uh, the higher your risk is. So we can clearly see and understand uh, all of these effects. Uh, and this is why the, these additive models, so these generalized uh, additive models or GAMS, uh, uh, are the workhorse of uh, insurance pricing. Uh, then, if they are so good, uh, in a sense, uh, why um, uh, why don't we want to stick just to uh, to these models? Well, the truth is um, that actually building a generalized additive model um, is very time consuming, uh, and especially on this first part here that we have, which is the heavy data preparation. So, um, it's nice to know that you can model a driver age as a single effect. Uh, but of course, in order to do that flexibly and to capture risk level in your portfolio to an accurate degree, you will have to choose, for instance, here polynomial degrees. So I will not only use driver age uh, with a linear relationship with my target, but I will also use the, um, the second power and the third power of that one to obtain this flexible curve uh, uh, that I'm showing here on the right. Uh, and how do I choose the degree of this polynomial, uh, similarly for the two other variables, or maybe how do I choose the groupings uh, uh, of uh, a variable like the number of uh, past claim for this policy? It's heavily dependent on the actuary. So uh, if I build the model, another actuary build the model, we will get to two different solutions. And this, of course, can pose problems, uh, not only at the process level, because it takes time and uh, you need more people and uh, uh, and more time to build your models and to refresh your models. But of course, it might bring pains also in terms of uh, regulatory constraints, because uh, if um, six months from now I come back and ask you, how did you build this model? You might not remember, or because the actuary has changed in the meantime, uh, it might not be the same person, and so all the decision making has been uh, lost. So how can we automate uh, this process uh, and like still maintain uh, the nice properties of uh, uh, of the GAMs. One way that in which we think uh, um, that we can automate uh, uh, this process is by leveraging an automatic data preparation, and in particular, uh, by considering not a, an additive model at the level of the variable, so at the driver age variable, but really at the level of every single uh, modality. So let's say driver age uh, uh, 16 now becomes uh, one of my variables, driver age 17 becomes a, another variable, and so on. Um, so, of course, the two representations that you see on both sides now of this variable transformation are equivalent. It's just a, sort of a, um, another mathematical massaging, if you want, of the, uh, of the equations. And the only thing we need to define is essentially what are all the different categories uh, uh, that goes inside this. But this can be done automatically. Um, and machine learning is very good at doing that. So, uh, once we have this base, we can start building our uh, uh, GAMs uh, on this new transform space, right? Um, so this is what, uh, um, of course, would happen naively. But what is then the output that we get? 
uh, let's assume that we can still combine all of these different coefficients that we get for driver age 16, driver age 17, and so on, into one single visualization, uh, which is, of course, possible. But the result, how the result uh, will it be if we do this uh, naively uh, with the GLM estimates? Well, the results will uh, lead to a very severe overfitting. So indeed, you will not be able uh, to uh, uh, really take advantage of these unless you uh, do things uh, uh, in a smart way. Because, uh, um, well, the reason why uh, this doesn't work out of the box uh, is because of the way how GLMs uh, are actually constructed. So um, you build the GLM by maximizing the likelihood. I don't want to go into very uh, many mathematical details, uh, but essentially this will try to make sure that the prediction